Ah, the shadow, the shadow, the shadow. What is there really to say about this character? He's one of the most important icons of popular culture from the 20th century, and without him, the very notion and concept of comic books and modern superheroes would not have existed. He's been in books, movies, and many different comics over the years. But where did it all start? How was he created? Why was he created? And what made him so popular and so influential? Well, in this three-part retrospective, we're going to be going back in time to the 1930s and following the shadow over his many creative journeys and examining the many twists and turns of the history of the world's first genuine superhero. This is The Shadow. Tale begins in 1930. The Great Depression had hit America, bringing about the end of prosperity and mass unemployment. Money was incredibly scarce and living standards hit rock bottom. It was also around this time when the film industry was starting to come into its own and reach some sort of prominence. However, it was seen as an expensive luxury and most could not afford it. However, most did have a radio, and during this time, radio would enjoy a golden age and become the de facto popular medium. Enter into this lucrative new market a publishing company called Street and Smith. Now, unlike the medium they were entering, their fortunes were not on the up. They had been struggling with sales of their detective story magazine, and with the ever-present specter of the Depression looming over them, they knew they had to find a way to make a hit and make money fast. And so they turned to David Chrisman of the Rough Raff and Ryan Advertising Agency and William Sweet, a writer and director, to adapt their magazine series into a radio show. Not long after, the two men began to bounce around ideas and eventually came to the conclusion that the series should have a mysterious and sinister narrator. And after thinking over a couple of different names, they eventually settled on The Shadow and found the actor to voice him, James LaCourtou, who later would be replaced by Frank Redick. Beginning on July 31st, 1930, The Shadow narrated the new detective story series. And before long, the show became a gigantic hit and fan mail poured in demanding a shadow magazine. Realizing the potential gold mine that was before them, Street and Smith turned to a young writer and journalist named Walter B. Gibson, who was also a practicing magician, to write a series of pulp novel magazines. Adopting the pseudonym, as was common practice of pulp writers of the day, Maxwell Grant, and opening up each story with the memorable slogan from the private annals of the shadow, Gibson began to work away and craft a series. And then, as Gibson began to sit down and concoct a persona for the shadow, he thought up of a villainous character, one who, using his sinister laugh and appearance, would combat the very criminals that, at first glance, he would seemingly be part of. And the influences for the character came from many different places, including film noir, as well as closer things like the mentalist Joseph Dunninger and the illusionist Howard Thudston, who were both friends of Gibson, as well as Bram Stoker's classic novel Dracula and The House in the Brain by Edward Buller Lytton. And finally, on April 1st, 1931, the first shadow story, The Living Shadow, was published and hit newsstands all over the country and quickly sold out. 
and would begin an impressive run of what was to be 325 pulp novels published between 1931 and 1949 the majority written by Gibson himself however occasionally other writers such as Theodore Tinsley and even on one occasion the creator of Doc Savage another pulp icon Lester Dent would step in and write anyway pulling ourselves back for a moment the first handful of issues were all ridiculously successful eventually leading to the series being turned from monthly to bi-monthly, meaning Gibson had to write two stories a month. And during the early years of the Pulps, many tropes and traits we associate with comic book superheroes were either conceived or refined upon, including things such as gadgets, a hero with a global reputation, whereas most heroes before were set to an area or just a country, and most notably of all, a rogues gallery or recurring villain, since before then most heroes only ever had one recurring nemesis, and for the most part four generic villains. Here, there were a couple of people that, despite the Shadow's best effort, he would return to battle again and again, such as the Voodoo Master, Shiwan Khan, the deformed criminal known as the Wasp, and the psychopathic millionaire Benedict Stark, known better as the Prince of Evil. Not to mention the many colorfully named villains that he would fight against, such as the Jackdaw, the Harvester, Le Vauteur, which is a French name for the Vulture, and a whole host of many, many others. In addition, the early issues introduced the Shadow's agents, people whom the Shadow had saved and now owed their lives to him and served him in his war on crime. In fact, in the very first issue we meet the Shadow's main agent, Harry Vincent, whom the Dark Avenger saves from committing suicide. In subsequent issues we would meet more agents, such as trustworthy taxi driver Mo Shrebnitz, contact man Burbank, Jericho Druk, a strong man who was unique for the pulps of the time given that he was black and a good guy, reform criminal Cliff Marsland, tracker Hawkeye, news reporter Clyde Burke, and most controversially Margot Lane, a socialite and friend of Cranston's, who was introduced in the, the pulps due to the popularity of the later radio show despite Gibson's wishes though this did not happen until 1941. Now as hinted at before the Shadow's adventures took him all over the world though they were mainly set in America. Some of the locations he visited and battled crime at included England in the stories The London Crimes and Castle of Doom, Canada in the story The North Woods Mystery, France in the story Zemba, South America in the story Zilti, God of Fire, and even Egypt in the story The Curse of Thoth. But now moving on, success, especially in financially lacking times, doesn't go unnoticed, and this was very true with The Shadow, as not long after his success, imitators such as the Phantom Detective and the Spider would employ similar premises of costume men with strange abilities, usually wealthy young men going up against organized crime, as well as more extraordinary enemies, though none would ever match the Master of Darkness's success. In fact, the boom was so big that Street and Smith themselves cashed in on it and created the Man of Bronze himself, Doc Savage who would star in his own long-running pulp and would himself become an influence on superheroes, most notably characters like Superman. Meanwhile, the radio character, while still popular, was eventually switched over to more romantic programming, and that proved to be a very unwise decision, and the program was a flop. And while he did return to another anthology series, it was eventually decided by the folks at Street and Smith that it was time to let this version rest and to give the character a proper radio series. 
1937, the company entered into agreement with a business called Blue Coal, who sponsored this new show. Then, that very summer, Walter Gibson sat down with writer Edward Hale Burstad to develop the show. And thus, the radio show that most people are familiar with was born. Starting with 22-year-old Orson Welles in the title role, who would later be famous for things such as the original War of the Worlds broadcast, as well as the maker of Citizen Kane, this new series changed up a couple of things from its pulpy counterpart, most notably giving the shadow powers of invisibility, whereas in the original pulps he used magician's tricks, as well as his black cape and hat, to blend into the darkness. In addition to removing most of the agents and only giving him a socialite called Margot Lane as his sole companion. Though later, Mo would be introduced into the series, though under the name Shrevy. Strangely enough, the show's famous tagline, Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men, was actually not spoken by Wells or any of his subsequent successors in the title role, but in fact the former narrator himself, Frank Redick, who used a glass of water next to his mouth to produce a more sinister echoey effect. The radio show, just like its pulpy counterpart, would prove to be another massive hit. In fact, so great was its popularity, it wouldn't leave the airwaves until 1954. And on top of that, accompanying the legendary tagline was was strains from an excerpt of one of the Camille Saint-Saëns classical composition Le Rue de l'Enfant. Of course, as hinted at before, Wells was not the only radio shadow. In fact, he only lasted up until the first year of the program, then left. He was succeeded by other actors such as John Archer, Bill Johnston, and Brett Morrissey, who would go on to become the longest running of the actors to play the shadow for over a decade and as such we finally come to the end of part one join me for part two where we'll look at the shadows early run in comics as well as his twilight years after the end of the pulps and radio show see you then